So welcome to Chapter 4, A Study of the Evolution of the Atom. The story that we're going to talk to you about today is kind of a history story at the beginning, but it will eventually evolve into understanding the structure of the atom and its basic subatomic particles that pertain to chemistry. This story is a fairly long story. It's been going on, for, at least in Western culture, for a few thousand years. And it begins with early Greek philosophers who theorized as to what they thought the basic structures of matter were, but had no scientific evidence to back it up. And that's a good opener to understanding why I like this history lesson so much. One, it's an old story. It's a couple thousand years old, at least starting in Western culture, in Eastern culture, who knows. But secondly, that long story that's been going on continues today. We have been building on the work of previous researchers that came before us, and throughout time, there has always been this direct transmission of teacher to student of the knowledge that they've learned. And then the student improves upon the knowledge of the master, so to speak, until we refine the model, until we get to what we call the modern atomic theory. So it really shows the connectedness of people over time. And finally, what's really cool is that you'll see on some of these history stories that some of the most important discoveries came about because of accidental or serendipitous discoveries. So we'll start in ancient Greece. Leucippus um, and Democritus are the Greek philosophers who theorized the existence of the atom. The word came from the Greek word atomos, which meant uncuttable. And beyond postulating that there was this uncuttable basic unit of structure, that was it. Uh, Leucippus was the teacher, Democritus was his student. It was more of a philosophical argument at the time. And we'll go and take a short break to watch a really quick little YouTube video about Democritus. And we'll stop it about two minutes in. Democritus was a Greek philosopher who was born in Abdera, Greece. He was born in 460 BC, and it is thought that he died when he was 90 years old. Democritus is considered to be the father of modern science. His greatest influence was another Greek philosopher named Lysippus. Democritus was his pupil and successor. Democritus was an atomist. He was also a determinist. Atomism is the belief that the natural world consists of two indivisible bodies. These two things are atoms and void. Atomism comes from the Greek word atomos, which literally means uncuttable. Democritus has a theory that everything was composed of atoms and that atoms are not divisible. He believed that in between the atoms there was an empty space and also that there were an infinite number of atoms, kinds of atoms, shapes of atoms, sizes of atoms, and motions of atoms. Perhaps. And I think that's a good place to stop. If we get too deep into this, we start seeing the kids spelling errors. So I'm okay with going back to our PowerPoint at this point in time. And so the idea is that the atom, according to the Democritus model, consisted of uh, the atom itself and everything else, which was the void. And that basically is the theory of uh, Democritus. <clears throat> now following or, or roughly about the same time, well, let's check my numbers on that one, so not exactly the same time, there was Aristotle, also a Greek early philosopher, who uh, existed between the years of 384 to 322 BC. Uh, Democritus, I think, was around 460 BC. And the idea is that um, even back then, chemists and scientists were kind of catty with each other and in competition, and Aristotle said, no, 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 no. Democritus, you're not correct. That all matter is made up of just four basic elements, <clears throat> and these elements are some combination of earth, air, fire, and water. And that's how he categorized matter. Again, nothing really to back that up, just a philosophical statement. So between that time of this glorious age of Greek and ancient Rome to when we began to come into the Renaissance or the Age of Enlightenment, there was this not so great time in human history, at least in, in Western culture again, 
where uh, things were pretty grim. And you probably know that as the Dark Ages. People were very highly motivated back then to see if they could take substances that were sometimes pretty gross, like dung or urine, and see if they could turn invaluable common substances into substances that were valuable, like gold. So we have greed as a motivator of the early chemists, except they were called alchemists, kind of bordering into um, sort of uh, magical uh, uh, realm. So the alchemists, while their chemistry was sort of based upon greed and not necessarily all that great, at least they opened the door to the beginning of experimental chemistry. And so we're going to leap ahead in time here to discuss several hundred years later the important contributions of Lavoisier and Proust. So Lavoisier was a French researcher who is famous for his law of conservation of mass. With tightly controlled uh, systems, as you can see here, he was able to prove that matter was neither created nor destroyed. And what's that got to do with the atom? Well, it lends itself to the statement that if there are these things called atoms, then they also can neither be created nor destroyed. Proust's law of definite proportions was that if you look at compounds, they are composed of specific elements that are always in precise ratios to each other. And the connection of this to the atom is that maybe down on the subatomic level, that, or the microscopic level at the atomic level, maybe atoms are combining with each other in precise whole number ratios or amounts. So these are experiments that look at the amounts of matter, but indirectly are starting to point the way towards the basic structure of matter. Now, <clears throat> after this particular um, period of time, which is approximately 1700s, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, um, Dalton comes along, John Dalton. And the cool part about John Dalton is that his atomic model is good enough today so that it withstands almost the test of time. John Dalton was brilliant. He was himself uh, very, very smart and was a tutor and a teacher and he became an instructor at a very early age of about like 18 or 19. This is in England. And using the work that came from the predecessors like Lavoisier or Proust or even the ancient Greek philosophers, he came up with a model or an atomic theory that fairly well holds true today and for which you will definitely be responsible. Now the tenets of his theory start with, yes, all matter is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. All atoms of a given element are identical to each other. So every atom of gold would have the same size, mass, and chemical properties as every other atom of gold. And if you're comparing, say, an atom of gold to an atom of lead, then their atoms of each specific element are different from those of other elements. He said also that atoms cannot be created, divided into smaller particles, or destroyed. Now remember, some of this isn't still true. And that he did notice that there is this definite simple whole number ratio in which atoms combine to form compounds, or what he called compound elements. In a chemical reaction, you can separate, combine, or rearrange atoms. But as stated in an earlier part of his model, you cannot create nor destroy them. And his model, if you were to draw a picture of it, looks something like this. So as you can see, he has the elements near the top of his chart, single atoms, and using various symbology to show them. And then as you see down towards the bottom of the chart, you're looking at combinations of those atoms, which he called compound elements. So Dalton, if you were to draw a picture of his model, envisioned that the atom was something that had like a solid sphere, like a little BB. And you will be asked on a future quiz or test to be able to draw or reproduce the basic models of the atom that we've discussed so far. So we're back looking at Dalton's model here, which you can visualize as a solid BB. Let's take a moment and see a short little YouTube about Dalton's contributions to the atomic model. Take a moment, call this guy up. We're hitting play. 
Nearly 2,000 years after the ancient Greeks made their initial theories of the atom, an English chemist by the name of John Dalton conducted an experiment in the early 1800s leading to the widespread acceptance of the idea of the existence of atoms. Conducting experiments with gases, he decided that elements have particles that combine in simple ways. He pictured particles as simple spheres. Dalton's theories had the following parts. First, all matter is made of atoms that can be combined. Second, atoms of the same element are exactly alike. Third, atoms of different elements are different. And fourth, atoms of two or more elements can be combined to form new substances. Dalton made tremendous contributions to the understanding of the atom, but his discoveries were not complete. So as the gentleman alluded, his discoveries were definitely not complete, but considering that he was working in the 1800s, I think he was doing a pretty good job. And the fact that most of his model still holds true today, with a few exceptions, is remarkable given the equipment and the technology that was available to him at the time. So we've come to a frontier. <clears throat> Dalton's model will soon turn into the modern atomic theory as early researchers from the late 1800s and early 1900s begin to break apart the supposedly uncuttable structure. So we will stop there, and please be advised that your teacher will probably have some sort of post-vodcast activity to submit to them. Take care, and we'll see you on the next vodcast about the modern atomic theory. Good night.